And I was just reminded here that sometimes it's very, very useful to be able to talk about practically nothing for eight years. Such is the way, such is the way when we go into uh, the world of uh, Saki, Imagine a seaside watering place. You've all been to these places, haven't you? Bournemouth or Scarborough. Yes. And we're back before the First World War. In that sort of quiet time. Heavens, cried the aunt Ver Clovis. Here's someone I know bearing guns. I can't remember his name. The lunch with us once. Ah, yes, Tarrington. That's it. He's heard of the picnic I'm giving the princess. And he'll cling to me like a life belt until I give him an invitation. And then he'll ask if he can bring his wives and mothers and sisters with him. That's the worst of these small watering places. One can't escape anybody. I'll find a rear guard action for you if you'd like to do a bolt now. Volunteer clearance? You will clear yard, ten yards start if you don't lose time. The aunt of Clovis responded gamely to the suggestion and churned away like a nine steamer with a long brown ripple of Pekingese spaniel in her wake. Pretend you don't know him was our parting advice, tinged with the reckless courage of the non combatant. In the next moment, the overtures of an affably disposed gentleman were being received by Clovis with a silent upon a peak in Darien stare which denoted the absence of all previous acquaintance with the object scrutinised. I expect you don't know me with my moustache, said the newcomer. I've only grown it in the last few months. On the contrary, said Clovis, the moustache was the only thing about you that seemed familiar to me. I felt certain that I'd met it somewhere before. My name is Terrington, resumed the candidate for recognition. A very useful kind of name, Sir Clovis. With that kind of name, no one would blame you if you did nothing particularly heroic or remarkable, would they? And yet, were you to raise a troop of light horse in a moment of national emergency, Tarrington's light horse would sound quite appropriate. Yes, and pulse quickening. Whereas if you were called Spoopin, for example, nothing of the sort would be at the question. No one at a moment of national emergency could be possibly belonged to a Spoopin's light horse. Yes, the newcomer smiled weakly, as one who was not to be put off by mere flippancy, and began again with patient assistance. I think you ought to remember my name. Oh, I shall, said Clovis, with an air of immense sincerity. My aunt was only asking me this morning to suggest some names for some young owls that she has just had sent to her as pets. I shall call them all Tarrington, and then if one or two of them die or fly away or leave us in any of the ways that pet owls are likely to, then there will always be one or two left to carry on your name. No, my aunt won't let me forget it. She's always been asking, have the Tarringtons had their mice? And questions of that sort. She will keep the wild creatures in captivity, you see, or to have all they want seen to, which is quite right about that. I met you at luncheon at your aunt's house once, broke in Mr. Tarrington, pale but arisen. <laughs> oh, my aunt never lunches, of course. She belongs to the National Anti Luncheon League, which is doing quite a lot of good work in quiet, unobtrusive sort of way. A subscription of half a crown per quarter entitles you to go without a night to a luncheon. Mm -hmm. That must be something new, exclaimed Mother Tarrington. Oh, no, it's the same aunt I've always had, said Clovis coldly. Well, I perfectly well remember meeting you at a luncheon party given by your aunt, persisted Tarrington, who began to flush an unhealthy shade of model pink. Um, what was there for lunch? asked Clovis. Oh, I don't remember that. So you to remember my aunt when you can no longer recall the names of the things you ate. Now my memory works in quite a different way. And I remember the memory long after I forget the people who remember forgotten the host of such a company. When I was seven years old, I recollect being given a peach at a garden party by some duchess or other. I can't remember a thing about her except I met her acquaintance was a little slightest, and she called me a nice little boy. But I have unfailing memories of that peach. It was one of those exuberant peaches that you were half away, so to speak. And they were all over you in a moment. It was a beautiful, unspoiled product of our house, and it had managed quite successfully to get the air of the compound. 
I mean, yes. I, you had to bite it and imbibe it for so long time. And to me, there's always been something charming and mystic. And the thought of the delicate velvet bloom of fruit slowly ripening and warming to perfection through the long summer days and perfumed nights. And then suddenly it came the thought of my life in the supreme moment of its existence. I can never forget it, even if I wish to, and when I devoured it, all that was able of it, I still remained the stone, which a heedless, thoughtless child would have thrown away. But I put it down the neck of a young friend who was wearing a very decolleté sailor suit, and told him it was a scorpion, and for the way he wriggled and screamed, he evidently believed it was. But where the silly kid imagined I'd have procured a live scorpion at a garden party, I don't know. Altogether, that picture me is an unfading and happy memory. The defeated Tarrington had by this time retreated out of earshot, comforting himself as he might with the reflection that the picnic, which included the presence of Clovis, might have proved a capitally agreeable experience. I shall certainly go in for a parliamentary career, said Clovis to himself, as he returned complacently to rejoin his aunt. As a talker out of inconvenient bills, I would be invaluable.